Hey everyone, I'm Alex. This is Code Along with Alex, and today we're going to take a look at Rust Attributes. So let's just get into it. So an attribute is metadata applied to module, crate, or some item. This metadata can be used to for conditional compilation of code, set the crate name, version, and type, binary or library, disable lint warnings, uh, enable compiler features like macros, glob imports, etc. Link to a foreign library. Mark functions as unit tests. Mark functions that will be part of a benchmark. An attribute like macros. So when attributes apply to a whole crate, their syntax is pound sign, exclamation point, and then crate attribute inside square brackets. And when they apply to a modular item, the syntax is pound sign, and then the item attribute in the square brackets. Notice the missing bang or exclamation point. Attributes can take arguments with different syntaxes. The pound sign attribute equals value, the pound attribute key equals value, or the attribute, the pound attribute value. So there's a couple different flavors of how you can format it. And attributes can have multiple values and can be separated over multiple lines too. So you can do something like the pound sign attribute value value two or pound sign attribute and then all these values with a new line thrown in for good measure. That was a lot of me talking. So let's go to code and create a project for ourselves. So actually we're gonna do, uh, we have a new directory that I made for this project called, or for today called 13 attributes. So we're on chapter 13 already, it's kind of wild. So next, let's create a cargo project called dead code. And we're gonna just open that right up. So I gotta duck down because my webcam is right blocking in the 13 area. We're in that danger zone. I gotta resolve that. So to start, let's create a function called used function and it's just going to be empty and we don't need a semicolon or anything we're good okay cool now we're gonna use the allow dead code attribute so that uh we get the we disable the dead code lint from the compiler we've used this before but we kind of didn't really explain it too well but i don't know if I even called it an attribute. I might have called it something else because I didn't know the specific uh, terminology yet. But uh, this is an attribute. So we have a function, used function, which I assume we're going to use. And then we have this unused function, which most likely we will not use. And then we're going to declare a noisy unused function. And you can see that there's no allow dead code attribute. So we're gonna get an angry, angry message from the compiler. And then finally, actually we already have a main function. So let me just replace the println macro invocation with used function and a semicolon. We can save that file. Actually, before I try to deal with noisy compilers. Let's comment out that function and just run the nice quiet version. So now let's change into dead code and do cargo run. You see everything worked lovely. No angry compiler messages. Next, let's see what happens when we uncomment the noisy unused function. Oh, and so we still get to run our program, but we're getting this warning that there's dead code. And so the default is to warn. And so if we want to avoid that, we can pass the allow dead code attribute on our noisy unused function. Save the file again, do cargo run, and you see that we don't get any more warnings. So. In real programs, you should eliminate dead code, but in these examples, we'll allow dead code because in some places, uh, they're interactive, and so it's helpful to learn, especially in the context of 
seeing what the compiler does and the types of outputs, whether they're warnings or errors. So, uh, yeah, that was a fun little foray into dead code. Attributes, next we're gonna move on to create attributes. So, let me change out of this subdirectory and let me do some reading and then we'll create another project. So the create type attribute can be used to tell the compiler whether a crate is a binary or a library, and even which type of library. And the create name attribute can be used to set the name of the crate. However, it is important to note that both the create type and create name attributes have no effect whatsoever when using Cargo, the Rust package manager. Okay, interesting. Since Cargo is used for the majority of Rust projects, this means real-world uses of crate type and crate name are relatively limited. All right, so I guess we have to do a project without cargo. So let's make a directory called make deer crates. And then let's change into crates. And then let's touch a file called, I guess, lib.rs. Yeah. And so now let's open lib.rs and let's do some typing. So to start, we'll do the create type attribute. And you can see the starts with the pound sign, the bang, and then create type. Ooh, not curly brackets, square brackets. Important distinction. Create type equals lib. And then, oh no, okay. Create name equals rary. So I see how like, yeah, when you're using cargo, you have the cargo to toml. You don't really need to mess with this kind of stuff in line in your function, but that's chill. Sometimes maybe you don't need cargo. So to start, let's declare this public function called public function. And then it's going to just invoke the println macro. Let us know that we called raries public function. Sweet. Next, let's define a private function called you guessed it, <laughs> private function, okay? And this will also invoke the println macro and it'll let us know that we called raries private function. Great. One more to go. Now we'll do one last public function, but we're gonna call this one indirect access. And this will also invoke a macro, but not the print ln macro, just the print macro. So we're going to call varies indirect access. And then that new line business that we've been using occasionally when we're not using cargo. And then we're actually going to invoke private function. Okay. So let's save this file, and now we're going to do rustc lib.rs. Actually, let me, let me make sure I'm in the right directory. Yeah, we're good. rustc lib.rs, okay. Then let's do ls lib asterisk, okay. And then we got that library. Cool. So when the crate type attribute is used, we no longer need to pass the crate type flag to Rust C. It just knows. So that's chill. Previously, I think we would have had to pass more information when we're invoking the Rust compiler. So this just kind of simplifies that in the context of a non-cargo project, which is not that often. But that's cool. Sometimes you got to learn things that aren't the most applicable to every day. Now let's move on to configuration attributes. So configuration conditional checks are possible through two different operators. 
the CFG attribute, uh, the hashtag or pound sign with CFG in attribute position or the CFG uh, bang macro for Boolean expressions. And so while the former enables conditional computation, the latter conditionally evaluates to true or false literals, allowing for checks at runtime. Both utilize identical argument syntax. CFG macro, unlike the CFG attribute, does not remove any code and only evaluates to true or false. For example, all blocks in an if-else expression need to be valid when CFG macro is used for the condition, regardless of what CFG macro is evaluating. So now let's create a project. Let's do cargo new. Let's just call this one CFG. And then we'll change into that. And then we'll open the main.rs and get going. So to start, let's create some new lines at the top of our file. And so now we're going to create a function that only gets compiled if the target operating system is Linux. And so CFG target or CFG target OS equals Linux. I'm on Linux, so I believe this should work. And I actually need to remove that. There we go. Now that is correct. Are you on Linux? Print ln macro. You are running Linux. How many times can we say Linux today? <laughs> All right. And so now, and then this next function only gets compiled if the target operating system is not Linux. So I do not expect this function to get compiled on my machine because I am on Linux. But I, I like how you can do um, kind of negating the target OS by just passing not and then uh, wrapping everything in uh, parentheses. Like that's pretty convenient once you learn that uh, shorthand, especially if you're just trying to do kind of minimal like Linux versus not Linux. I don't know, maybe there's a way to do this in a more uh, matchy way when there's multiple conditions, but we'll see. Or maybe you can just specify like Linux or Ubuntu versus Debian versus Red Hat, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so FN, are you on? Interesting, so we're defining the same function name but be, depending on the operating system, a different version will be compiled. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. And now let's go right into the main function body. We don't need a configuration attribute but we are going to invoke the configuration macros now. And so to start, let's delete this line, replace it with R. Are you on Linux? <laughs> Linux. I should have had a counter. We need to do the counter next time. The Linux counter. Okay. Print LN. And now, are you sure? Linux. And then, okay. So if configuration macro target OS equals Linux print LN yes it's definitely Linux and then else print LN Yes, it's definitely not <laughs> Linux. Okay, and now we can save this file. And do cargo run.
and I expect it, this program to say, you are running Linux, and yes, or are you sure? And then yes, it's definitely Linux. But let's see. Cool. Everything worked as expected. All right. And so for our final section for today, we're going to move on to custom configuration attributes. And so let's create another project. So some conditionals like target operating system, target OS are implicitly provided by the Rust compiler or Rust C, <clears throat> but custom conditionals must be passed to Rust C using the dash dash CFG flag. So let's do such an example right now. I'm gonna change back to that directory, cargo new, custom, CD custom. And then let's open. Sorry, my voice is getting all ragged. I need to have a sip of my beverage. Cheers. Okay, much better. Now let's add some new lines above our main function body. Let's declare configuration attribute. We'll call this one some condition. And then we'll define a function called conditional function. And you just print ln condition met. That's what's invoked when you trigger conditional function. Oh, itchy nose. And then we'll replace the println macro in our main function body with conditional function. Save or save. So now if we do rust C, gosh, see ya. Actually, we change into source. So probably shouldn't have made a cargo project for this, but that's fine. We can still invoke Rust C. But uh, yeah, let's do Rust C, and then we're passing the dash dash CFG flag in some condition, and then the Rust file that we want to change, and then at at. So I'm going to call this main instead of custom because I didn't actually title my file custom main.rs and then at, at dot slash main condition met. <laughs> nice. So we could kind of tweak this like, uh, let's do is dude. I'm a dude. Are you a dude? Is dude conditional function. Is dude certainly and then save and then when we run our rust C again instead of passing some condition let's pass is dude is dude certainly <laughs> sweet and you can see how we're starting to pass custom configuration attributes to our function, which is pretty rad. Uh, we're growing deep. Um, but yeah, this was pretty much it for today. I'm going to open the lesson nested hierarchy so you can take a look, but we're making good progress. Uh, we just finished chapter 13. Next, we'll be covering generics, but this was a, another short section. It seems like the lessons were much longer in the beginning, and they're just getting a little more succinct which I kind of like. Um, yeah, just want to say thanks for hanging out. It's been a blast, and hope to see you next time. I'm Alex. This has been Code Along with Alex, and have a great day.